So I'll begin by reading the bios of um, our speakers for the first panel. And I'll start with Mr. Osasenaga Enogiru. My, my apologies if I mispronounced your name. I've been practicing, but um, you know what happens when you over practice. Um, OSAS has extensive experience driving innovation programs in, in innovation hubs and large corporations as a consultant. He has been an innovation coach to startups and has helped set up more than 180 innovative entrepreneurs in Sub-Saharan Africa by running startup mentoring programs at Inspire, Innovation Hub, and more recently, the Impact Hub Lagos. He is an experienced entrepreneur business coach and startup mentor. Osasinagara brings in his experience of working with local entrepreneurs in Nigeria, focusing on how their development and innovation capacity can influence the ecosystem, resulting in social and environmental impact. He is able to achieve this purpose by creating programs that equip youth with skills they use in building businesses. I don't need to say more from here. <laughs> He's a failure of the Young African Leadership um, Initiative, where he got recognition for his business development skills. He's also a valuable mentor for African Entrepreneurship Award. Um, our next speaker is Damilola Ashaleye. Um, she's the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Ashtam Solo of Ashtam Solar Company Limited. As a young girl, having experienced the loss of a family member due to petrol explosion, Damilola dreamt of eradicating the dependence of Nigeria on fossil fuel and became part passionate energy. With a passion to solve the energy insecurity of Nigeria, she confounded Ashdam Solar Company Limited and has been involved in renewable energy, off-grid and hybrid systems with innovative projects. Dan Lola is the lead instructor of Ashdam Solar Academy, which is aimed at improving the technical know-how of renewable energy practitioners in Nigeria with international standards and have trained more than 500 practitioners to be successful, technically inclined solar PV installers and entrepreneurs. Um, and our final speaker for this session is Mr. Tochuku Chukweke. Um, I need to add that um, Clintonel Innovation Hub um, is a, a major partner of Clintech Hub on this project. And Tochuku manufactures and commercializes local innovation and trains youth in other states through his company, Clintonel Technologies. Clintonel Technologies is a company that develops, manufactures, and commercializes local innovations. While the Clintonel Innovation Center is a social enterprise and youth development arm, CIC is a solar powered youth development center where youth in other states and environments are equipped with skills for technological de development innovation, STEM, career excellence, and job creation. Its vision is to raise a new generation of scientists, inventors, technology developers that will harness technological innovations for collective prosperity. These are very interesting and hopefully packed by you. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, please confirm that your video is turned on and that you are able to speak. Loud and clear, I can hear you, and I, and I believe you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Mr. Tochuku, are you here? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. And um, Ms. Don Milola. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. So I'll move on to um, you know, the direction for our conversation today. And I would just like to hit the ground running. And my first question will be to Ms. Damilola. And my question is really, what are the business opportunities in the renewable energy sector? And what practical steps can students take 
to assess these opportunities? Yeah, so <laughs> there are several business opportunities in the renewable energy oh, sector. And yeah. um, oh, sorry, <laughs> working from home today. So, um, example is installation, and there is also skills of components. There is mini grid aspect. There is commercial and industrial application. There is even architecture. Architecture is possible in solar energy using passive solar systems, adding energy efficiency into your architectural. And also, there is policy. There's policy making for lawyers, there's finance. So there is a very diverse, diverse um, opportunity within the renewable energy sector that no matter where a student is, you definitely stay, find a fit in because there is there are, there are diverse opportunity in renewable energy. Um, so I was trying to speak. So I, I, I definitely agree with that. There are vast opportunities in the sector. Um, and I'd like for um, Mr. Sochiku to also speak to that, um, you know, to just give us your um, perspective on this question. Okay. Um, like uh, um, let me say, there are so many opportunities in, in the sector. Um, 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 I think she has mentioned almost everything there. <laughs> so, but in addition to what she said, there's also an opportunity which I think maybe might be the biggest, um, which is starting and running startups, uh, renewable energy startups, uh, to grow into big companies that will employ uh, a lot of young people. So that's a, an area that there's a lot of globally, there's a lot of attention towards re renewable energy as an alternative or complement to um, traditional energy uh, uh, systems. So there is a need to have young people um, create startups that will build businesses around delivering services and products within the renewable energy um, sector. So uh, there is opportunity for, for that. And I think that's the biggest because there are so many investors who are interested in in that sector, and they're looking for bright ideas, uh, great team that they can invest in. So that's one particular area that um, they should pay attention to. Of course, that's in addition to what Daniela said about uh, the other, other opportunities in installations, in um, sale of um, home units that are already existing solar units for homes and you know, offices. You can become a, a retailer or a reseller. You know, that's, that's something that you know, even students can do on a part-time basis. There's also an opportunity for uh, maintenance, you know, um, for repairs and, you know, other things within that sector. But most importantly to me, I think is the startups um, um, sector that, you know, uh, holds a huge opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And this is especially true for startups that have to do with sustainability, um, startups that drive innovative products, especially in, in that space. And it then leads me to my next question for you, sir. Um, this, this is breaking. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, so I think, can hear you. Okay, you can hear me, great. So yeah, so it brings me to my next question because I know that you, you are big on sustainability. What makes a business sustainable? What, what are the things, what are the, um, looking for the best choice of words but what are the things the criteria for that you you know what makes basically what makes a business sustainable what do you need to see in a business to say yeah that this is a sustainable business especially in the renewable energy sector so who are you who are you asking are you asking me you sir Okay. I'm asking you, yes, as a follow-up question, yes. Okay, okay, follow-up is okay, beautiful. So for, for a company to be sustainable, I think is I think there are general, you know, um, requirements that cross across every business that wants to be sustainable. Uh, one of that is um, um, long-term thinking, you know. Uh, a business should be able to see the future that it wants to play in and then begin early to prepare and then to build towards that future. So a business that doesn't think about long-term, 
that just about the immediate when the world is changing. So as things change and you don't, you're not able to adapt, then you know that business will die um, naturally. Then also, uh, if it is sustainable, of course, if it's profitable, that means if it generates enough revenue to cover its expenses and then have some extra as profits that you know can help can be reinvested. To good the business of or, or even um, distributed as, as shares to to uh, as a dividends to um, shareholders. Uh, a business is also sustainable if it's flexible, flexible to change because the society is changing and it's changing so fast. Technology is facilitating, is amplifying the rate of change. So as society is changing, um, consumer needs are also changing. So a sustainable business has to be able to follow up on the changing consumer needs and then be able to adapt its business, its services, its products to be able to meet the needs of the consumer. And then at the fast rate, because the, the things are changing so fast with the technology. So you, you must be able to adapt to that uh, change. Again, uh, it's also um, helpful to be relevant or to contribute to the progress of society where you're operating. So we call that complete social, social responsibility. So if you want to be sustainable, you should be able to create impact in the society where you operate. These are some of the things that I feel are important uh, elements of sustainability. I agree. I definitely agree. And um, you know, as a country and as a people, we know that sustainability is very important, but we also know that there are a lot of challenges facing startups um, and facing sustainability generally. So my next question is really to Mr. Osas. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges facing sustainability? And we'd really love for you to speak from a very... Um, from a very practical perspective, because um, you're a stakeholder in this space and you deal with a lot of startups. So you understand the challenges that they face on a... In Hello. Hello. So I think she has network issues. I don't know right. if you get yeah. a question. If you did, yeah. you can. So I think I should just go on. I think to answer that question, um, understanding the realities in Nigeria. So I'm going to speak in largely about doing businesses in Nigeria, the challenges as well. Then I'll speak a lot to some, somewhere in my explanation, I'll speak towards uh, West African businesses and of course Sub-Saharan sub African businesses. Uh, before I start, let me give a little bit of a practical um, situation. So uh, one of the things I do is I actually support ventures, that's businesses, startups who are outside Nigeria to come into the Nigerian market. Uh, so in January, we worked on getting one of the ventures who is based in Tunisia to you know, enter into the Nigerian market. And I was actively involved. Like, the, the point is this. So typically, I'll be on the other side teaching businesses how to grow, giving them strategies and all. But this time around, my MOU or my, my TRO was to you know, set up that business in Nigeria. Now, the realities are, first of all, the policy was very hostile. The policies were very hostile. The policy, policy realities in Nigeria is actually very hostile. Uh, to get your business registered in Nigeria, it's it's on paper, on, on the platforms, on paper, it looks very simple that you can actually go online and register uh, your business. But in reality, um, it took about um, seven weeks to get the business registered despite the fact that the platform, uh, I mean, recession is online and all that. So the policy itself is not very favorable to do business in Nigeria. Uh, but that's not something that we are new to. It's something that has always existed from time in Moria. So we have somehow found a way to curb that. The next thing is the access to finance. Um, access to finance in the sense that, okay, so there are different stages of business, or there are different types of businesses. So you have the high growth potential startups, uh, they are diff then you have the dynamic businesses, you have the survivor businesses. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay, somebody said they can't hear me. So, uh, so you have the dynamic you businesses, you. you have the everyday businesses. There, there are different types of businesses, and there are different types of funding for these different businesses. 
Now, when you say your has um, high growth potential startup, uh, it means that you can do 10x in a year. So you can do you can do 10 times whatever it's you're doing in a year. Um, the funding that's available for such startups differ from the funding that's available to people who are in the survivor stage kind of business. So survivor businesses are businesses people who just people just do because they it's an alternative to unemployment. That's the best way I can explain it. It's an alternative to unemployment. So I just go get. Uh, get a store, set up a business and all that. Now, now bringing it back to the realities of raising finance. If I was raising finance for a startup high growth potential business, the reality is that at idea stage, there's not just enough funding to actually support me. The conventional funding instruments that are available in the market, uh, debt financing by taking a loan to the bank or even research grants in universities or some of the research institutions in Nigeria, are not available, easily accessible to businesses to even set up. And so you see there's that gap. There's that gap when it comes to funding. Now, when you now come to the survivor kind of businesses or the dynamic businesses, the reality is it's even worse because nobody actually even believes in your business to start with. Nobody believes it's going to be successful at the end of the day. So people are left to either borrow money from friends, families, and any other person who believes, who seeks to, to believe in their business. So finance, access to finance is actually very difficult. Um, it's one of the major issues when it comes to building sustainable businesses. Um, in Africa today, um, there's a $2, two trillion dollar deficit uh, when it comes to funding businesses. Now I'm not talking of just startups, I'm talking of generally businesses. In other words, if you bring $2 trillion to Africa today and say you want to give to every venture or every business out there, uh, we, will have, we will not have any funding gap. That's the reality. So just look at how big that figure is. It's as big as the US economy, if not even bigger than the US economy. That's how much we need um, to actually fund businesses in Africa. So again, I've spoken about policy. I've spoken about, um, I've spoken about um, funding. The next thing I will speak about is regards to the technical know-how. So I feel um, we've, we've had, we've had We've not had it very good when it comes to the technical know-how. Um, or maybe, the, let me rephrase, let me rephrase that. Um, we've had, we, we still have a long way to go when it comes to technical know-how. Uh, a lot of persons see publications online, uh, you know, Paystack, Flutterwave, and the others, and they believe that I can do the same thing. And now, in as much as those success stories are very important, I do not debunk the fact they are very important. The fear I have is that it sends the wrong messages. Because what we are doing is we're celebrating success, but we are failing to also see the difficulties that existed to actually attain those successes. And so someone sees it and somebody see, decides to now quit his nine to five and choose to go set up uh, any venture. You know, let me just go and set up something. Let me build a startup. Now the challenge is that this person does not have the technical know-how to actually build a venture. When I say technical know-how, I'm not talking of whether the person can code or not. I'm talking of the concept in itself of human-centered design or design thinking, how to actually get product market fit, not just building any app or building any solution and say, yes, I'll get markets. So at the end of the day, what you see is that they are looking for a problem to their solution rather than looking for a solution to a problem. You understand my point? So that's, that's a reality we have in Nigeria today. So again, policy is an issue. Um, finance is an issue, access to finance is an issue. Finally, uh, the technical NOAA is an issue. So these are the main top three. There are many more issues. You have issues of infrastructure, access to internet, access to you know, rent and all that. But these are the top three major issues that affect business sustainability in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. You touched on a lot of points, um, especially the one about product market fit. And sorry, hold on, wait. Yes, great. So especially the one about product market fit, because you find that, can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. You find that a lot of people build solutions and they start looking for problems to those solutions. And, you know, like you said, there's not enough funding to go around in the first place um, to now not have um, the best of ideas that solve practical problems. Um, thank you very much for that. I'll come back to you, but I'd like to ask Ms. Damilola to speak to this as well, especially as you are in this space, you are in the renewable energy space, and I'm sure that when, you know, in starting Ashdam and in running the business that there are challenges that you faced that could be sector specific, 
or could be you know general but that you want to speak to thank you for that so um mr Osaz has said a lot and i would also like to add about the insecurities like the national insecurities ongoing especially if um if you are looking at investing or going into the off grid space where you are going to um, rural locations, last mile locations. So these are some threats that entrepreneurs and businesses like us have to face and have to think about and have to think of how to mitigate that because there is, there is a lot of insecurities going on in the country. So that's another threat that we have to, that is existing within the space. And here is also the change of regulations there's changing regulations, and then there's policy also, just like Mr. Osa says. And then also, there's also consumer preferences. So these, these are also some kind of threats that, um, that, are, that is there in the industry. Like, you have to really know your target market, and there are different kind of preferences. Now I'm talking about the practical aspect now in the real industry. So there are different kind of preferences for different levels of level of um, consumers. So you also have to think about that if you're going into this space. So that's what I want to say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. This is a final question. This final question goes to all the panelists and, and anyone is you know free to take the question first. But, um, as we round up this panel and begin to get into the next, what advice would you give to new entrants into the renewable energy sector, especially as it, you know, as it pertains to avoiding some of these, because you've been there and you've done that. Um, and so you're in a better position to advise new entrants to say, avoid this, you should do this this way, uh, and, you know, and all of that. What would you say to your younger self if you were to meet your younger self and this is a very important question because <laughs> we run a six month incubation program for um like i mentioned ideation to early stage renewable energy businesses and you find that even though there are people like yourselves who have this process and have learnings from them young entrepreneurs still go and make these mistakes. And one of the mistakes is, like, like Mr. Osas said, building solutions, sometimes for problems that don't exist. Um, so I'd really like to hear from um, each of us um, before we, yes, before we round this. Okay, so I can go first. Um, what, what I would say is that we should, um, for new people that want to join the industry or anybody that wants to join the industry or already in the industry, if you don't have this in place, you really have to have it, which is your structure. So when you are going into business or you're going into the energy industry, you have to think of what structure do you want to put in place right from the beginning? Because this structure is what will open up opportunities for you while you are within the space. So you really need to think about your structure. How do you want to add the structure of your business? And another mistake that um, a lot of entrepreneurs or a lot of people do make is the financials, the financials, even startups. So right from the beginning, you have to start tracking your financials, like in practice. A lot of us actually made that mistake. I said I made a mistake when we started the business. But yes, we are collecting already. So your financials, right from the beginning, start tracking it, start putting everything, your financial statements, everything, start making sure that they are there practically as you're you going on. So that's another thing. And another thing I also want to say is that we should all know that something is, um, is a rent. It is not owned. So we don't own process, which means that we have to be innovative every day because we have to pay for our rent for the process. We have to pay for rent of that process every day because it is not owned, it is rented. And for you to keep that rent, you have to pay every day, which means that you have to be innovative all the way. You have to go with the tide. You have to start coming up with new ideas. 
every time for you to be successful in the renewable energy space, the innovation is very, very important. So that's all I'm going to be saying for now. Yes, innovation is very, very important. Um, I want to especially emphasize what you said about structure, because a lot of new entrants coming running portfolio businesses, and I say this with the most respect. Um, so it, one of the things that we do for our startups is that we teach them how to um, structure their businesses properly and you know, do their financials properly especially when it comes to bookkeeping and financial management, especially because as they progress, you find that when you're, you know, when you're reaching out to donors and funders for grants, they want to see your financials. They want to see how you are managing your money. They want to see what you would do with, with the money they plan to give you if they give you the money. So thank you for that contribution. I think it was very helpful. Um, Mr. Osaz and Mr. Tuchuku, I'd like to hear from you as well. Okay, so uh, maybe I can go second. Um, so the first thing I want to say to um, people who want to go in there, um, and I'm going to say this considering our environment, the Nigerian environment and the African environment, is that every good thing takes time. So they should be patient. This is very important. They, should not expect to go into start up a business today and maybe in the next, next month they will they've hammered your foot, you know. <laughs> it takes time. So before going in, they should understand that it will take some time and then be willing to stay till they succeed. So they should not be in a hurry. Every good thing takes time. So, so patience is important. Then again. That should also be a long-term thinking. So I, I think they should have a balance between short-term thinking and long-term thinking. Where do you want to go? They have to see the end from the beginning. So they will be properly guided. Then um, this thing I want to talk about is knowledge. They should learn. Um, in this computer age, there's a lot of information by the click of a button. So let them do take time to do research, to learn, to study, to acquire skills. It could be business skills, it could be technical skills, but let them have some skills that you know are relevant to the business they have to go into. Because if you are starting up and you don't have skills, you have to hire people and be paying them. Most of us can't afford you know, um, uh, salary rates at the beginning. So, but if you have the skill, you can be maybe paying yourself or sacrificing, you know, to survive so um, learn some skills and then if you can find a guide or a mentor someone that can guide you and you know help you um in the journey and um, that's what i think thank you yes I, thank you so much for that especially for your statement about you know finding a mentor it's actually very important and i think it will form part of the basis for my for my um well maybe not question but what I want Mr. Osas to emphasize on. Um, so I would really like you to speak to this as well, Mr. Osas. Um, what, you know, what advice do you have? What would you, what's the word? What would you want every new entrant to know as they come into the sector? But more specifically, I want you to touch on the importance of incubators and, you know, sort of speak mm -hmm. to how new entrants, yes. Um, and. I, Offline, I'd like for us to speak more extensively on this, but um, how can, because sometimes they don't know, these opportunities are there. Right. They don't search for it. They Absolutely. don't know they exist. You know, or, uh, yes, funding is a major issue, but sometimes there's funding and you're not even qualified for the funding. And this is, you know, grants even. You, you, you get the money, you don't even know what to do with it. So Absolutely. could you please speak to that, but more especially talking about the importance of incubators and how new businesses can maximize the this support um, and then go on to grow their businesses. All right. So I was going to actually that was actually one of the points I was going to state, uh, but I'll let that be my last point. Uh, so a couple of points as I would give would be first of all, you do not get paid for showing up. Um, so you just come in to do things it does not mean that you get paid. You actually get paid for solving problems. Um, so that's let that be your 
mantra or let that be something that you actually put in front of you that the fact that you're going to you know you're showing up every day does not mean you get paid for that mm -hmm. at the end of the day you actually get paid for actually solving people's problems so it's not by going to your shop or fabricating and everything it's actually are you solving the problem which brings me to my second point which is as much as possible be people focused uh, do not get carried away by okay this is what i want to do this is my idea this is what i want to achieve right it might be what you want to achieve but it's not what the market needs so as much as possible focus on how exactly it concerns the larger markets who will benefit from this that way it will be easy for you to respond it will be easy for you to actually even um, get people to actually buy your product to so be very people focused that person that has the problem what's the person's environment um, like who are the major influencers of those persons how much is those person earn on average those are things you focus on um, focus on innovation rather than inven invention so invention is basically doing making a product two times better innovation is we're starting and scattering the we're scattering the the system they are disrupting the system and making something entirely different so focus on largely on innovation rather than in invention because in the long run uh, people will catch up to invention but it takes a longer time for people to catch up to innovation the last point is as much as possible get into a community um, i cannot overemphasize how important a community is when it comes to accessing markets accessing customers accessing um, opportunities it is very key. Um, hubs, innovation hubs, innovation clusters, uh, clubs, associations, it is very important because at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, it is only those persons who are aware of your solution that will see value in your solution. So if I'm not aware that you have a problem that solves issues of electricity, there's no way I can use your solution. So one of the shortcuts or one of the hacks to actually getting people, more persons aware of whatever it is you're building or even getting people to give you feedback is to join a community, join a hub, make sure you're part of a hub, you're, in, you're, you're participating in a hub. That way you have access to uh, mentors, have access to coaches and whatsoever. So there are a lot of persons who go and build in their garages. I'm not saying you should not build in your garages, but largely the thing is when you build in your garage, the only feedback you will get most likely is your feedback or your friends and families. When you bring it into the open market, that's when you realize that um, that's when you realize that largely it is not right. That's when you realize that largely it is not actually what you were thinking that was actually a solution a problem. Uh, maybe I should give you a particular example. So someone going into a loop village and saying because the soil is fertile, he wants to plant tomatoes and it is close to the river bed. By the time the tomatoes was ripe for harvesting, the day before harvest, he comes there and realizes that hippopotamus has come out from the river and destroyed the tomatoes. Then he asks the villagers, why did you not tell me there's, there are hippopotamus in this vicinity? And the villagers told him plainly that that's actually why we do not farm close to the river. You understand? So do not focus on building so much that you do not get feedback from people. So get into a community. Thank you very much. Yes, feedback is important. Uh, um, sadly, we've come to the end of our own session. I just feel like taking this session throughout the day because every time I listen to um, Mr. Tochupu or you, Mr. Osas, and Mr. Damilola speak, I just want to keep taking notes. I hope that everyone in the, um, you know, that the participants have also learned from this as well. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we appreciate you for joining us and for sharing from your wealth of knowledge. Yes. So I'll be handing over to my colleague, um, Chukuno So KK, to take the second um, to take the, se the second session. But before that, I'd like for everyone, sorry, before you turn off, for all the panelists on this session to please turn on their video for a quick photo. Thank you very much. Um, please, where is Ms. Damilola? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, where are the others, please? Hi, Helen. All right, thank you. Um, and yes, over to Nonto.
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the second session of today's webinar. Um, as my colleague mentioned earlier, my name is Chukunam KK, and I will be moderating this session. Um, before we start, I would like I would just like to give a warm welcome to the panelists on the session. Uh, I would like to start by welcoming Mr. Oh, sorry, give me a minute, please. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by welcoming Mr. Asosa Imokwede. Um, so Mr. Asosa is a business advisory associate with the All On Hub. He provides operational support and builds the cap capabilities of angel growth and market entry stage off-grid businesses operating in the Nigerian energy sector. Prior to joining All On, he engaged in various consulting roles in the renewable energy sector for startups and large corporations spanning across different elements of the value chain, including development of mini grids and micro utilities, technical sales, energy brokering and business advisory services. He has also worked with the largest power utilities in the United States, Exelon Corporation and Duke Energy, where he spearheaded several unique utility scale projects directly contributing to both the company's bottom lines. His responsibilities spanned, uh, spanned across engineering project development, project management, and operations and maintenance. Asosa obtained a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Morgan State University in the United States, a Master of Science in Engineering Management and Leadership from Purdue University in the USA, and he's a certified project management professional. Um, sorry, just, just to confirm, can everybody hear me loud and clear? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is um, Mr. Goziem Ukubo. He is passionate about creating access to opportunity for Africa's brightest ideas. He joined All On to lead origination and transaction structuring, working with internal and external stakeholders to deploy capital and support to clean energy companies. Prior to joining the team, he developed structured finance solutions and advisory for clients in the oil and gas and power value chains at GT Bank, where he also led bank-wide strategy projects focused on redesigning enriching experiences and retail strategies for involving customer segments. He started his career as an impact investment analyst at the Tony Olumeli Foundation, where he helped to build and manage a portfolio of double bottom line investments in agriculture, technology, health, financial services, and education sectors. He contributed significantly to the design and development of the largest Africa, Africa-focused early stage venture capital intervention, the TEF Entrepreneurship Program. He studied banking and finance at the University of Benin and holds a master's degree in finance from the University of London. He serves as an advisor to entrepreneurs and change agents across Africa, volunteering for impact-led organizations, including the Af African Conservation Foundation, the Slum to School Initiative, and the Kingdom Business Network. And finally, I would also like to welcome Ms. Helen Watts. She is a Student Energy Senior Director of Global Partnerships. She oversees Student Energy, Energy's Global Fund Development and collaborates to design new programming with public, private, and civil society sector organizations. She is the founder of Student Energy's Global Youth Energy Outlook, which will launch in November 2021 at the UNFCCC's COP26 in Glasgow. Helen co-founded the Greenpreneurs Virtual Incubator for Youth-Led Social Entrepreneurs enterprises in the global south along with co-founders at youth climate lab and the global green growth institute helen played an instrumental role in the energy transition action track of the unsg climate action summit in 2019 to bring youth engagement to the energy transition program supported by, by supported the first youth pilot program at the clean energy ministerial and mission innovation ministerial and worked with irena to design and launch the first IRENA Youth Forum at the 2020 General Assembly. Helen is a Forbes 30 under 30, one of Canada's top 25 environmentalists under 25, and graduated from Concordia University in 2017. So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to all three panelists, and I thank you so much for joining us on today's session. Thank you. So I'm just gonna go ahead and dive right into um, the meat of this session. And this is about the role of youth in Nigeria's energy transition. Um, as, as we all know, um, the importance of transitioning to clean, sustainable, and environmentally friendly power is not only to 
protect the environment as it is today to reduce carbon emissions, but then also to ensure that we create a sustainable, um, create sustainable forms of power that could actually maintain and fulfill the needs of future generations. So it's very important to have the youth today actively involved in it. So my first question is, and it's directed to Mr. Isusa, how can the youth engage more to advocate for and accelerate the deployment of renewable energy and advancing the sustainable development agenda? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. It's glad to be here to um, discuss with everyone on the call, you know, and just, you know, just engage um, with regards to the youth and energy transition. So um, for your first question, uh, I'll, I'll just start by saying um, the youth are the future. So we, the youth, we're the future. You know, they're, they're, therefore, I, I think that, you know, youth um, focus organizations need to take a deeper look um, into all the benefits of, you know, renewable energy and as it relates with, you know, sustainable, um, as, as it relates to the sustainable development agenda. Um, most especially like, you know, in rural communities, um, renewable energy um, in Nigeria for one, um, has, um, has a large, has a large role to play because of the abundance of, you know, sunlight, for example. So um, with that, I, I would say, Rural communities in Nigeria are actually able to attract, you know, a significant amount of investment, and there are a lot of benefits to, for um, host communities that actually um, look um, towards renewable energy. Some of these benefits, of course, include, you know, new revenue sources, uh, new job opportunities, innovation for the community, impact building, and you know, community empowerment. And let's not forget, you know, affordable and clean energy. So now let's let's relate that you know with the sustainable development agenda. You know there are 17 um, um, SGD goals, of which um, I, I'll say renewable energy actually checks off you know um, a good number of those. You know once it's actually invested in like a new um, community, for example. So I'll, I'll just end by saying the, the youth definitely can you know advocate for re renewable energy in, in communities as this would definitely um, take us closer to the sustainable development, to, to take us closer towards achieving the sustainable development agenda. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and it actually kind of leads into my second question because um, as we know in Nigeria, um, a lot of the youth often feel disenfranchised. We feel like we don't have a voice in the um, growth and the development of this country. We don't have a voice in where this country is going and, in many situations when we actually try to speak up, whether it's exercising our democratic rights or just, you know, showing that we are actually invested in where this country is going. Sometimes we feel we're shut down by whether it's powers that be or just older people in positions of influence, be it public sector or private sector, because they tend to feel, you know, with the experience that they have, they offer more value to the country than we do. And, you know, it's, it then ends up silencing a great many of us who then might, you know, feel hopeless or feel like we have no control or say over the direction of the country. So because of that, I want to ask, and I'd like to ask Mr. Um, Okubo this question, what um, would you say is being done to drive youth inclusion in Nigeria's energy transition, whether it's um, from the private sector or from the public sector, just from an angle of your perspective and your experience, what would you say is pushing youth inclusion in the uh hi can you can you confirm you can hear me awesome sorry could you sorry what, what do you say no i just wanted to confirm if you could hear me oh yes i can hear you i can hear you okay great great um, um thanks thanks for that question it was a very interesting question um very briefly i think that um you know one of the most interesting things about energy access as an issue is that um, it, it affects um, the youth directly. Um, Nigeria is a young population, uh, the majority of Nigerians, the vast majority of Nigerians are, are below the age of 35. And um, as it relates to energy access uh, as a catalyst for industrialization, um, for entrepreneurship and things like that, you, you then see that you know, this is this is a this is an issue that directly affects youth, and um, and and really calls for uh, 
used to take the four in developing in developing solutions uh, and, and being part of that conversation. Uh, from the private sector perspective, which is where I sit uh, um, as an investment associate at, at All On, um, what we have we have rec recognized this um, uh, this this challenge uh, as well as how you know it takes youth inclusion uh, to to come up with with solutions to this to this challenge. And so, our investment uh, our investment initiatives are are majorly targeted at the youth. So, for example, we, in all on we have a portfolio of about 27 companies um, of which the vast majority of the founders and, and staff members are youth um, this shows that you know africa's youth especially nigeria's youth um, are able to come up with ideas um, and execute these ideas uh, focused on on closing the energy access gap and really what they need is support um, so they need support from policymakers. Uh, they need support from investors uh, in, in the areas of access to finance and, and an enabling environment. And those are some of the things that all on as an institution is looking to provide. Um, but there, there, there can be so much more. Um, and I'm glad to see more investors in the space, glad to see more initiatives targeted at improving the, the uh, enabling environment, improving the regulation, improving standards and things like that to ensure that, you know, an industry develops, um, an industry develops sustainably. One of the other speakers in the previous panel talked about communities, you know, and it's important that, you know, the, the industry develops as a community centered around youth and youth-led solutions to, to the energy access problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's, that was a very comprehensive answer. Um, and you touched a lot of base, including part of my next question. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, Ms. Watts about um, the representation of the youth in the uh, energy sector as a whole. And I guess since you touched on it a bit, I would like, um, Helen, if you could expand on that a bit, maybe give your perspective in terms of what you feel the youth um, representation in the energy sector is from a, what, whether it's um, the perspective of the global south as a whole and just you know based on some of the agencies or bodies that you've interacted with some of the things you've seen in your time working there how would you say how well would you say the youth is represented yeah it's a really interesting moment right now for young people working on renewable energy or who want to kind of move into renewable energy because you see these really big institutions kind of sitting up and paying attention to youth right now. Um, you know, I think the youth climate movement, which really united young people around the world, um, around this common goal of, you know, let's address this now and our leaders are not doing that and we need to kind of take back our power as a global youth movement. Um, you see organizations like IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, um, like Sustainable Energy for All, these, these really big institutions that have a lot of influence over the global energy space. Um, kind of thinking, okay, how do we work with young people? How do we navigate this new space? Because it's it's not easy to, or there is resistance to starting to think about including young people in these legacy processes that have run the same way for you know decades and decades and decades. So I think that is really changing right now, which is exciting. And I think starts to really help young people to internalize their value as important stakeholders in this conversation and as, as really people who have really unique perspectives and important contributions to add to this conversation. Um, but I think it still needs to go a lot further than that. Young people are still talked about as these beneficiaries of you know, opportunities in the sector or as these vulnerable groups who are most impacted by, by energy access challenges. And while that is true, there's a really important mindset shift that my organization and, and others in the space are really trying to push for where we see young people in terms of their unique abilities and skills to really push the growth of the renewable energy sector and push the agenda and bring new kind of innovative, um, innovative approaches to policy design, where we think about co-benefits in new ways. Um, and that is not quite there yet. So I think generally there's more of an appetite for talking about youth, for having youth at the table, but what that looks like in terms of you know, allowing young people to have a really tangible, you know, visual impact on policy and on the conversation, that's still something that has a long road to go. Um, 
And at a global level, I think it can sometimes be a lot easier to do that than at a country or city level as well. So once you start kind of getting into the really unique natures of regulatory systems or the way that um, governments are run, which which is different from country to country, um, you know, young people in those communities are then faced with, okay, well, globally, we're kind of told and empowered to feel like we have a lot of power and agency in this conversation. But then I approach my government and there's resistance because they're not quite as you know invested in this global conversation. So that's, I think, where the challenge exists and where I really try and direct young people to connect with other young people because there is power in numbers. And that's something we're trying to do through the Global Youth Energy Outlook is how does the intergenerational power dynamics that exist in the space, how does that change when you have numbers kind of to back you up, when you have this really significant demographic body that um, do have an impact on who's voted in in elections and um, can really push for community-wide adoption of new technologies and can have a significant impact on market growth. Um, once you have those numbers to really back up your vision and back up what you're pushing for, you have a lot more power in the space as young people. Um, so that's maybe, yeah, a little bit on kind of what I'm sensing in the, in the space more broadly and then some of the barriers that still exist and opportunities where I see we can start to kind of push push change in this area. Thank you. Um, that's, that was fantastic. And actually gave me I don't, I don't think we can hear you now. So I don't know if it's just me. No, I think, yeah, I think you froze. We can just give him a, a couple of seconds, see if he reconnects. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. Had um technical challenge. Um, I, I was trying to ask a question and it was based on something that um, Helen said. And it's, um, you know, of course, like you mentioned, and the, it's sometimes it's easier to look at it from a global perspective and think, you know, as a global generation of youth, we have this power to take control and drive the world towards a more, more eco-friendly and sustainable future. Um, but then when you bring it down to the more local levels, you have different, different power dynamics. You have different countries that operate differently and re regard the youth differently. So I'd actually like to throw this question to um, Mr. Sosa. And I want, I want to ask, what would you say are some of the most effective ways that maybe some of the um, more like some of the Western countries could maybe lend their support to more third world countries or just more developing countries in terms of empowering the youth um, in spite of some of the challenges that they may face in their own countries? Okay, um, that's, that's a good question. So how, how you're basically asking how exactly the first world countries can lend help to third world countries. So, um, First thing that comes to mind for that is uh, technology. So I mean, technology is technology is, is, is key. Technology is great. Technology is definitely um, one way in which um, um, a, a first world country can can definitely help or support a third world country. Um, and, and another another way is through you know um, training capacity capacity development. So. Um, in this sector, for one, this renewable energy sector, um, we actually lack um, a lack lack a lot of uh, um, highly skilled or highly trained workers. So, a, a first world country, for example, can can definitely develop, you know, and, and which they're already doing so, you know, through um, different uh, international organizations. Um, basically, develop training programs that they could either offer for free, you know, or at a subsidized rate to um, people in third world countries because essentially when you're actually um, when you actually develop skills in, 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 the, in the third world countries then you can actually now um, have the youth in the third world countries um, come up with brilliant innovative ideas that would also now lead to like entrepreneurship and then the first world countries can now come back around and then you know potentially invest in these great ideas 
you know, and that way, you know, it's just a full, it just comes full circle, you know. So I mean, that's, that's, that's what I think from my standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gossi, would you like to follow up on that, um, what you said, just any contributions on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the last point that you made, which was uh, investment is is key. Um, we need to invest in, in all sorts of areas around the value chain. We need to invest in capacity building. Um, um, there is there is a lot of work to be done. And, uh, and you know, in the, we have a tendency to think of energy access as a developmental you know, need, which it is. But it's also an economic opportunity as well, um, uh, especially you know, given some of the some of the innovations in the space in the off-grid space, uh, and 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 how the you know prices and things like that are trending downwards, opening up this opportunity. So there's a lot of work um, and a lot of opportunities for uh, for people, especially in countries that uh, that have. Um, population time time bonds that they're that they're managing and so um, capacity building uh, is and, and, and resourcing and upskilling um, is, is a is a big area that I see you know a lot of investment you know needs to go into we need to upgrade the capacity of our technical institutions um, we need to upgrade the, you know just the, 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 the skill set and then um, and then just access to finance I keep making that point because it can't be you know, over overestimated. There, there needs to be money um, put behind uh, uh, companies and entrepreneurs who are looking to take advantage of this opportunity and build solutions. Um, because one, there is an economic case for these for these businesses, but also two, um, we need it. You know, we we need it for all sorts of social outcomes, for education, for healthcare. Um, for for entrepreneurship, there there's there's no problem um, in Nigeria that we have today that we cannot you know that we can't really you know relate to um, to to, the, to 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 the lack of power and, and our our performance. And so, um, if if developing countries are going to move forward, if this is uh, there's there's a lot of areas for partnership, uh, a lot of areas for investment and, and collaboration. And, um, and that's the way I see it. Thank you so much. Um, I really, I like what you um, pointed out when you talked about, and I know you've all briefly touched upon it, the um, the connectivity between renewable energy or like the, um, the future of youth in the energy sector and the economic benefits and fallouts of that. But that I also want to look at it from like the potential political angle of it. And that's, uh, we, we're all aware of um, politicians running for election with the campaign promises of we'll provide you power, we'll provide you jobs and some of these things. And I would like to know, is that, how would you speak to the youths about maybe demanding more of a presence of whether it's renewable energy or just sustainable power generation in like some of the things that they want to see from their you know, elected officials or some people who are running for elections as opposed to just, you know, the run of the mill promises for better jobs and better money. Like how, how much would you like encourage the youth to take an active role in demanding some of these projects and some of these realities to be funded by the government officials who are trying to run for elections? So, uh, yes. so, uh, so also, also, um, I guess, I guess Mr. Susa, you could start, start with that. that. Sorry, I wasn't able to hear that. Okay, I think I'm, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, this is a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, it would be a little controversial, uh, but I, I, I would say um, for, every, for every candidate that, you know, comes out you know, for, for, for an election, for example, uh, you would always have, you know, the candidates who are really just in there for themselves, and I'm talking about developing countries. So at this point, we know with this, uh, you always have you know the candidates that are just in there for themselves, and then you also have the candidates who are you know likely to be like technocrats who actually want to um, develop um, the the community, develop the country. Um, so, so I'll say um, the youth should align themselves with such candidates. So. 
you have such candidates who are act who you, at least you know from the surface you, you you can tell that they are all about you know actually building and not you know necessarily taking down or, or destroying what's you know what's already been built. So I'll, I'll say the youth should align themselves with such candidates and um, try to um, get in early in the game. So you get in early, you know, when these candidates are still making all their promises and you know try to try to see if you know our our agenda as youth as it relates to us with this with this uh, um, discourse right now with renewable energy is actually you know part of their their, their mandates basically. And uh, I'll say if we if we get in early enough, get in the conversation early enough, you know, support as much as possible. Um, I would say um, we could potentially, you know, see some different results from what we currently see. Thank you. Uh, Helen, would you like to um, say something on that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I think, I think this is where a lot of um, kind of understanding the kind of different ways that we need young people to show up and act is really important. So we need young people as entrepreneurs. We need also young people as entrepreneurs working within companies. We need young people really mobilizing citizen advocacy and support for certain candidates. And I really liked what Isiosa you said around know which candidates you do support and put your weight behind that rather than necessarily trying to kind of put all of your energy into challenging candidates that aren't following through on their promises. Like think about how you can really flip the vote. Um, and also getting young people into politics, I think is really, really important and not something that's talked about enough anywhere kind of across the globe is um, a lot of young people are resistant to get into politics because we're so disillusioned and frustrated by leaders who continuously let us down. And that's really, I know from a personal level really makes me resistant to thinking about going into that space, but we really need um, young people to be moving into policy roles, to be moving into um, into elected officials roles um, to start really kind of embedding these, these sustainable kind of future thinking approaches into government. Um, and so that's also something that I would really encourage and think about, you know, is there a level that makes more sense in your context, depending on what country you're in? Um, I know that city elections and running for kind of city office can often be a really important starting point um, and a way to make a lot of impact at a city level. And so think about, you know, are there any avenues there where you could get involved? Um, but, you know, given that this is really kind of about entrepreneurship and innovation as well, I think there's a lot of opportunities for um, young people who are interested in working in all of these different ways across kind of the value chain, I guess, of changing an energy system um, to collaborate together and to work together and to understand where the needs exist and where the opportunities exist. And so if you have young people who are looking to kind of move into an election cycle or you have candidates that you support that really do align with your vision for um, achieving uh, SDG 7, achieving universal clean energy access, um, you know, really rallying young people who are working in all of those other sectors, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, um, policy, rallying them together to really put their weight behind that candidate and support them and feed in a lot of information about what they're seeing in all those different sectors um, to really create a well-informed platform. Um, so taking a really collaborative approach to, to kind of pushing for, for a stronger agenda um, is probably the advice that I would give. But again, so different from a context, you know, country to country basis as well. And, um, and I would say kind of from that perspective, it's first important to understand where have young people created an impact in the past and how can you build off those learnings and how can you engage with young people who are already engaging in these on these issues and maybe don't have an energy or a climate focus but you can maybe come in and bring that climate and energy lens so maybe they're pushing for stronger democracy um, from elected officials how can you kind of come in and amplify their movement by adding in this dimension of renewable energy access and reliable energy access um, and make sure that that's integrated in what they're pushing for. Because if there's an existing movement that's working really well to shift, to hold leaders accountable and to shift, um, kind of change the election, then it's, it, it is more effective to not start something entirely new, but really kind of think about how you can add dimensions to that movement. Wow, thank you so much for that. You really just jumped right in and that, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Mr. Gosiam, any like final words on this question or just like something to wrap it up in a neat bow? Yeah, I think uh, um, I think in summary, young people need 
to find communities um, to belong and participate in in in, in our communities. Um, I think we um, like like uh, like Helen said. There's if you if you have an existing community, you don't always need to reinvent the wheel. I think um, we can go where the energy is and and try and you know. Um, um, harness that energy um, to change the system in the way that, that, that we see fit. I think, um, you know, the world um, over the last couple of years has shown us that it is possible um, and, and young people can make change um, when, we, when we speak together um, and, we, and we engage with the system that way. And it just takes being willing to, 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 to do the work, um, to collaborate, um, and, and to speak with one voice. Um, so I would, that's what I would encourage, you know, find a community um, that, is, that is engaging with the system. If you wanted to bring in a climate focus there, build, build consensus, build relationships um, and, and start talking to each other. And by the time that we're engaging with the system, um, um, and find someone who understands what we're saying is willing to, to, to negotiate with us and, and start from there. That's, that's what I would say. Thank you all so much. This was, um, you, you really bestowed upon us a wealth of your knowledge and experience. And I really, really appreciate it. Um, getting diverse answers, diverse perspectives, and just all the information you gave us, I'm, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that you could all make it today. So thank you so much for this session. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, so I guess I can't keep asking you any more questions unless I'd like to. But um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. So um, I'll just hand back over to my colleague to um, run the next session. Um, you ready to? OK. Yes, I'm definitely ready. Um, and for our third and final session today, we'll be talking about the upbeat energy additional challenge, um, which is like I mentioned earlier, a uh, project funded and supported by Olon to identify and support innovative off-grid energy solutions and you know, help them move from idea to proof of concept and get to market. And it, there's no better team to have this conversation with than our uh, alumni from the first cohort who coincidentally um, happen to be students of um, Federal University of Technology Owerri. So I have with me Chibona Obuna and Gif Moneke. And I will go on to read their bios briefly. But before that, I'd like to confirm that they are in the room and they're able to speak. Um, Chibona, do we have you here? Yes, absolutely, I'm here. Yes, and Gif. Yes, great. So this is going to be a very, because we all know each other, so <laughs> it's going to be a very informal conversation. You know, we're just going to gist and we're going to share what we learned last year in the hopes that that will inspire um, not just the people on this uh, platform listening right now, and because we're going to, you know, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel. So for, for every student who will click and watch to say, I would want to go on this journey just because of what you know what they've heard. So I would just encourage us um, to be open and to share so that we can all learn and you know gain from this experience. Um, very quickly I will start by introducing Gift Moneke. Gift has over five years of experience in electrical engineering. He's a co-founder and CEO at Green Air Technologies, where he focuses on the manufacture and sale of portable solar generators for small homes and businesses. He also has vast works in the internet of things and robotics, and has volunteered for many events, include, including the funding space, a popular entrepreneur and investor meetup. Gift was one of the 10 entrepreneurs out of 200 selected who pitched their businesses um, at the Forbes Nigeria Summit, which was the culmination of the Nigerian edition of Forbes' first digital startup accelerator program. Um, and also, um, 
one of the winners of the CTIF All-On Incubation Program last year. Um, the second person on this panel is Chibuna Obuna, who is the co-founder and CEO at Renewcycle Energy Limited with a background in chemical engineering from the Federal University of Technology. Please, if you're from Futo here, can you raise your hand? Um, because uh, you're the ones reigning here. And a diploma in sustainability and circular economy from Lagos Business School. He developed his interest in renewable energy, entrepreneurship, and sustainable development. He currently volunteers with Student Energy as the regional coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa on the Global Youth Energy Output Project. He represented Nigeria at the first international renewable energy agency, Irina Youth Forum in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates in January 2020. Chibuna was nominated democratically by the SDG 7 Youth Constituency, United Nations Major Group for Children, and Youth and youth as the Africa, sorry, and youth as the Africa Youth Representative at the fourth meeting of the high-level group of personalities on Europe-Africa relations or forging an Africa-Europe Climate Alliance, Green Transition, Sustainable Energy, and Agriculture. He is an alumnus of Clean Tech Incubation and Acceleration, all on 2020, a social innovator and fellow at LEAP a Sahara Impact Fund Fellow at Sahara Foundation and a Fellow of the International Sustainability Academy, Hamburg, Germany, 2021. Chibuna leads the team at Renew Cycle Energy to implement renewable energy products and to develop affordable decentralized renewable energy solutions for target customers in Nigeria. He continues to gain advanced education in renewable energy. Um, welcome once again, um, and very happy for us to to kick off. And I think my first question will be to, to Chibuna. Um, you know, share from your experience, tell us about the ideation challenge and what your experience was from the point where you saw the um, call for applications, your decision to apply, and what that journey was for you. And more specifically about the challenges you faced through the process and the impact that this program had both on you as a leader and on your business. Um, you can take you know, four or five minutes to speak to this and then we move to here. See, in five minutes, um, but I will do my best to be very brief. Um, okay. Okay, first of all, uh, we've been building our company Recycle for um, quite a while, since 2019. And um, so at a point, it was as if we don't know what we are doing again because it needed uh, clarity, you know, and we were looking for an incubation hub that we could um, go in in order to um, understand what, we, what exactly we were doing. And immediately we found uh, the Clean Technology Incubation and Acceleration Foundation opportunity. We decided to apply. And uh, though we applied almost very late, almost at the ending, um, but at the end of the day, we still got in. So we had to go from Oweri to Uyo for the pitching competition. And um, on arrival, we are called on to be among, among the first three to pitch, and we did that. After a while, the judges um, asked us some questions, and from there, you know, we, we went back to our school. And by May of last year, we got we got, uh, we got a mail from the Technology Hub that we have been selected to participate in the six months incubation program. So while it was virtual because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we knew it was going to be very challenging because it was um, a new um, a kind of a new environment. So even if we are going to pitch and learn, we are going to do everything virtually. So it was quite challenging. Uh, however, we braced ourselves up and we determined to be among uh, the best who will, be, um, who will be selected at the end of the whole incubation program. Actually, we didn't know it was going to be um, uh, like a competition. We didn't know it was actually a competition after that process. We thought we'd just go into the incubation and um, that would be all. But we discovered along the way that with the, um, with the assignments that were given, attendance to the, uh, to the course, uh, to the lectures, and also in terms of our you know, productivity, our act, act, activism, our activities, the way we participate well in the activities uh, in the program, 
all those things added up to the final demo day results. You know, a lot of people felt that it was just a demo day pitching that made us be among um, the, the best selected companies. However, it was an accumulation of all the processes that were involved. So it's, it was challenging, especially for data, because sometimes we had to, um, you know, we are, we are in lockdown, we are not working, so we are just at home looking for ways to get data and also make sure that we are, um, we are at the at the incubation. So most times I was the only one representing my company because at least uh, Cleantech made it uh, possible that one person can represent for a company. So I was always at uh, the meetings and I, I, I thank God that I was able to, you know, have that resilience to pull through. And um, I learned a lot from the community in terms of collaborating with other participants in the program, you know, checking up on each other, making sure that we are all, you know, going together. It was not just about me or about my company. It was kind of a learning process for me, learning from other um, leaders, learning from other co-founders. At the end of the day, throughout the six months incubation program, I learned about you know accountability. I learned about um, that is a lot of accountability was a major thing for me because I had to show up for those meetings. I had to be I had to be there, you know. I had to learn what the lecturers were were saying, what the panelists were you know were saying, and I had to see how we could implement it as well. And again, in terms of my leadership, it helped me to um, it helped me to understand how to listen more to people because before I could just only come up with my own ideas. You know, I don't listen a lot to my team. But after the incubation program, I discovered that I started to listen more, you know, to my team members, and it has been amazing because we've been coming up with amazing solutions uh, to our problems, to challenges, and that has really helped and improved me as a person. So um, and that would be all. That would be all for now. Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much for that. Thank you, especially um, because it helped you listen to not just your team but the market. Um, if you were here when, yes, you were when Mr. Sass was speaking about people building solutions for problems that don't exist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so give please share also, um, just as Chipuna has done. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, great. So, um, Stephen has given the intro already. Um, the normal process was what we went through to, although our pitching location was um, at ABA, um, but we went from school, went to ABA, we pitched and everything. So, um, looking at the nature of the program, the six month incubation, like the kind of six months kind of process. We knew that um, at the end of six months, we're not going to be the same, right? So uh, we were in for it for the long haul. Then the pandemic um, came. So I know that the process um, was actually meant to be both virtual and um, on site. But now everything became virtual. So we had to be uh, coming online, doing attending meetings and everything. So it was interesting because um, you can always come online, right? And always attend lectures. But one thing is practicing it, putting those things to lunch practice, right? So um, the way the program was structured, um, you, you, you get to ask questions on a personal level. Um, you get to meet mentors, especially when they paid us mentors. I think that, that was the, that was a no brainer because it was what made us like bring out a full portfolio to the person mentoring us. So it helped us so far from um, where, although, although we are, had already started, but the direction and the guidelines and everything we need to scale wasn't that clear. So um, we, at the end of six months, it was easy for us to navigate through scaling up, bringing out um, business models, scripting out the world that won't work and everything, and listening to the market more. So I, I think the whole process is all about was all about helping us know what we are in for. We are in for um, the long haul thing and making sure that whatever thing we are putting, in, uh, putting into the business is something that will make us scalable. We can all see what is going to be scalable. It's um, a very good um, measure that we really love for the program. So we learned a lot. We even learned about um, one important thing I got to know about these financials and all, because um, you have to be able to keep records of what you do every day, right, in the company. Um, and in, in terms of financials, because currently um, we've been able to get access to some, uh, we're talking to some investors, so it's easy for us to um, bring up our financials, for you for us to make um, post analysis and we could understand each other, right? So without that, actually, it would have been possible. So I think it was a good experience, and um, that's it.
Yes, I agree that it was a great experience. Um, but I know you, um, and you know each other, but I'm sure that the participants uh, might not know um, what you do, who you are, what you do. So maybe this is a great opportunity to tell us about the businesses that you run, you know, your innovative startups, and um, what they do, and how do they impact the unserved and underserved. And, you know, anybody is free to go first. I hope you've got my question. Chicken at the first. Hi. Yes. Very well. Who's going first? Okay. Um, yes. Let me okay. let me um, speak about it. All right. Great. 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 So, um, prior to the incubation, we we're just um, focused on manufacturing standalone energy systems, right? So, well, um, at some point, we had to look deep into what we actually solution we actually given. Are we actually solving a generalized um, generic solution um, problem, or we're actually making a solution particular to particular segment and everything. So from what we learned, we were able to know how to um, categorize our solutions into whatever needs they are meeting. So currently, we have um, a solution where we generate electricity in um, from large quantity and we distribute to users, end users, and it becomes a solution basis. So for those people below the pyramid that can't afford to buy single standalone systems, they have the opportunity to subscribe to our energy service. So we have the energy as a product, one of and we have the energy as a service also one of so, um, those two things are the things we're running and currently we have a new um, product which uh, we have um, a tech solution where the public can actually also invest in these are large um, solar farm projects for people living in community so you invest and you earn from people that subscribe to our services so um, that's basically what we do and um, we are currently moving and it's been it's been nice also and so Thank okay. You. Um, okay. Um, over to you, Chibuna. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that um, introduction of your your business. So, the, prior to the incubation, we also um, had uh, an idea to um, produce inverter systems locally made in Nigeria, because we saw a need for um, our homegrown solutions. However, after the incubation program. Uh, we realized that we are not focused on a particular target market. So we are generalizing our target market to everybody, but actually it cannot work that way. You know, you need to have a particular target market for whatever it is that you are rolling out as a product. So we also we, so we also didn't understand the dynamics behind what we are doing, because in terms of manufacturing inverter systems, you now have to talk about um, import duties, talk about um, the taxes, talk about the facilities, talk about all those things. So everything that involves into the manufacturing and uh, the distribution of your products. So we're able to learn all those things through the incubation program. And it, the highlight for me was the fact that we now had an idea, the idea for a target market, which we have already started testing. And we have um, started conducting our market analysis for that. And we are targeting we are targeting uh, mini grid developers for our inverters. So we are developing mini grid um, inverters for mini grid developers. So uh, that is what we are doing for now. And um, going forward, we are also going to be rolling out some digital solutions. Uh, that's a software product. Uh, it's currently ongoing uh, because I don't want to say it out right now because it's still an IP that we are trying to protect. Uh, so but once we are done with the legal aspect of it and um, and, and all the registrations involved will be able to roll it out for uh, for the first for the better launch and all that so thank you so that's what we are doing thank you thank you so much so um again i would like to ask i know that on this journey especially so both of you are students to start businesses because it's something that even people who have left school for years are unable to do um so you are, you know, you are the biggest champions, but I know that you face some challenges. You talk about your businesses with the glue and anybody beside you would think that you don't face any problems. You don't have issues. You know, there are not times where you're confused or you feel like um, you're not sure what the next steps are. So maybe share some of the challenges that you faced, you know, just so that those listening can avoid those challenges, you know, as much as possible. Share the challenges that you faced and how you overcame or the steps you took um, to solve those challenges. 
one or two would be really nice. Um, and I would ask Chibunga, yes, to answer that question. Or whoever is ready. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, you didn't face any challenges? Yes, I did. I did face. Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. Actually, the first thing I would like to say is that um, entrepreneurship is a long-term journey, and that's that's what Tony Lumelu said. So when I when I when I decided to embark on this journey, I knew that it was a long-term um, journey. So in terms of reaping profits or benefits at the short term, was not was not even in the in, in the books as, at all. I knew that it was going to take a long time. And being in a very unique country, we are in Nigeria. There are a lot of challenges for businesses, a lot of challenges for young people. So it really requires resilience and um, a very determined mindset in order to you know, pull off whatever it is that you have. So we, uh, my company just came as an idea. And that idea was to actually bring, you know, it was like a dream that needed to be better, right? So for me to, while in school, when, when, I, when the idea came out in school, I also considered the fact that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the university, how am I going to carry all this along? But I also had that fear that if I don't actually bring this out now, I might make mistakes later or the interest might go, you know, in the coming years. So it was pertinent for me to start immediately when the idea came. And it has been a journey of, it has been a long-term journey of learning and learning and learning, you know, you failing, standing up. Sometimes you don't even know what you are doing. Sometimes you are confused. Sometimes you have so many ideas. You don't know which one to execute. You know. Sometimes it's like a lot of people are already ro rolling out their products. What are you doing? You know. What what are you what are you to get so far? What have you done? Another thing again, another challenge there is as a student, you also have the lectures, you also have um, practicals and other things that you need to do. So I've been able to manage my time by cutting out a lot of uh, let's say I won't call them just distractions, but cutting out a lot of um, extracurricular activities or extra or anything like things like watching football match, you know, and all those. I was I've been able to cut them off uh, because I understand that for this business to actually work. There has to be sacrifices. Hello, okay, so and I've been able I to commit myself. I think what has helped me mentors, you know, in hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, why go on? Yes, okay. please go on. Okay, so what has really helped me so far is that I have so many mentors, including uh, Mr. Ifani Orajaka of uh, Dream Village Electricity Project, and so many mentors uh, we met at the incubation program. And the major thing that has also helped me is in terms of maintaining these relationships and building these relationships for a long time. Because on this journey of entrepreneurship, you can't work it alone. So you need that support and also supporting my peers as well. So Git here is my brother, is my friend, is a business partner, is a business relationship. So the, 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 the idea of learning from each other, from learning, learning from your peers is also very crucial. So uh, you don't just say, don't assume that you're the smartest in the room. Don't assume that you are the best, you have the best idea. You need to learn from others. You need to come down and listen to what people are saying, observe and also learn from others. So that has been what has helped me so far on this journey. And then just having an open mind, knowing that there's enough for everyone, like there's enough and there is so much for everyone. There's so many of what you are. idea is as long as you stay consistent and focused and you're able to have an open advice helping so far. Can anyone hear Chibuna? Is it just me? Yes. yes. Okay. I think he I was having because yes, he was breaking. Um Chibuna, are you there? I think your network was bad, but I heard I the most of what you said. Yes. So your network, um, you know, you were having a bit of technical challenges, but we, I got the meat of what you said. And and I also want to hear from Gift, you know, okay. what challenges did you face and how 
um, how did you surmount those challenges as we begin to round up? All right, definitely the first challenge as students should be being a student, right? Because <laughs> yes. um, sometimes you might need it to spend your time with maybe some particular documents, or you need to meet with someone, submit all this pitch deck, pitching and everything. Sometimes they plan to do some things that you already have some um, plans and schedules as students. But um, there's sometimes you just have to um, choose one as priority and everything. So that's just the normal challenge. Then core business-based challenges are uh, like while we're starting up, you know, we have people, like people in rural communities that have bias to new technologies, especially solar technologies and all. So while we're starting, the person was like, um, this solar stuff is not good for my lighting, it's not good. So sometimes what we do is we say, okay, let's give you this thing free for five days, free for two days and everything. And they check it out themselves. And at the end, they see that it's just a mix, right? So um, those entry, market entry challenges are what we're bound to face as entrepreneurs, which is normal for wherever space we find ourselves. Another challenge is um, in terms of um, finance, right? How we start you know, there are some times where we just need as little as one little amount of money that we don't need to add up to make up um, for the particular thing. And we, we but we, we are still growing, but we, we, we just need a little amount of money to just make our brain faster and everything. But it taught us how uh, we character out waiting, right? So being patient with that slow growth and everything. So as of last year, we were trying to push, we were like, if we had this amount of money, this would have happened, this would have happened and everything. But in the long run, currently we can see that um, Tango we waited, right? Tango we waited and allowed the markets to adapt to what we're doing and everything. So the issue of finance initially would also is a major challenge for entrepreneurs. And also, you know, in distributing electricity, right? You may have this issue of theft, people coming to that flight, you know, in Nigeria and everything. A lot of persons are not really civilized in the way in the whole thing. So, this um, monitoring um, energy you are generating and everything, but we've been able to avoid that with, um, with meters, right? With metering and everything. So, we're going to avoid that challenge. We also have this, had this challenge of this village cows, because the majority of our work are in rural communities and we have people, so young guys. And the villages that that feels that nothing happens in their community without them, they don't even listen to anybody, right? You have them coming to taxi for this, taxi for that, and everything, irrespective of whatever thing you tell them you're doing for that community. We've been able to overcome those challenges. So at least sometimes you just have to make this for your friends, let them know that you are doing this for the greater good and everything. So while we are coming to new communities, we are now like prepared to face those challenges. So those previous challenges um, kept us um, on guard. Uh, whenever uh, any new community are going to enter, we're bound to see those things, and we already have um, roadmaps and strategies to advance those challenges. Um, so that's definitely our challenges, and we've been able to survive. Interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, my final question as we round up this session would be. Um, what would you say to people who were like yourself a year ago, who are wondering whether or not to apply to this program? Should they apply? Um, you know, and you know, just a word of encouragement to other students to say, you know, you can do this with your idea, and you will receive all the support you need um, in terms of a network, in terms of funding, um, support, mentorship to grow your business. Um, especially for those who are listening right now and who will, you know, watch this much later. Anyone can go first. All right. Um, I always, I always like follow this particular words. Do it afraid. You no, know, why you are afraid? I think that's the best time to do it. You know, as students, you always uh, regarded with um, being playing safe and everything. Everything is risky. Even even not doing anything is risky, right? So. Um, there are opportunities out there. So let's just imagine an opportunity out there. So you just need to take that bold step of searching for them. Like this, for instance, um, a lot of persons are um, getting um, help to do this opportunity. This entire um, particular incubation is very key. We're trying to enter the moving sector as a business owner. So the opportunities out there, just make sure you don't afraid. If, if you Definitely, you have failed to come, but that's part of the process, right? So we just look at it and keep moving, keep moving, keep searching out for opportunities. You might submit an application. Um, you know, you know, one particular application might 
might be in front of a lot of rejections, right? So you may have rejection emails, a lot of things. You just keep pushing. You just have to the right words, and that's it. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Gift. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Gift. Um, I've been taking notes from what you've been saying as well. <laughs> you haven't seen all. <laughs> yes, I've been taking notes to my pen here. Yeah, so, um, well, what I, was have, what I have to say finally for um, young entrepreneurs who are considering joining the renewable energy space is first of all you have to really be sure that this is where you want to be because this space is a very very nascent um, industry it's very young especially in sub-saharan africa or in africa generally so you have to be very very determined and sure that this is what, what you are going to be doing for a very long time like you need to be very certain that i'm going to be here in the next 10 years i'm going to be here in the next 15 years okay so that mindset will already give you a long-term perspective how you're going to follow on your journey okay so when you meet a challenge or when you meet a rejection you are not deterred by that you are focused because you are seeing the long-term view and the long-term goal secondly have a long-term vision about your company or your service or whatever it is you are building in fact i i am an advocate for young entrepreneurs to build for the long term okay don't just apply because of Oh, they are giving ten thousand US dollars grant. What are you going to do with the ten thousand US dollars grant? And what if you are going through the incubation program and at the end of the day you don't get the ten k um, US dollars grant? Will you still push your company with your brand? You know, so that's a question you need to ask yourself. So, um, myself and Gibbs, we have experienced so many rejections from two thousand and seventeen up to now. So we are not uh, we are not newbies in terms of rejections, but those are the things that help you and as you. Keep getting rejections as you keep feeling you get better and you keep getting better so it's a, about a growth mindset you need to have number one be sure and certain that this is what you want to do number two have a vision number three have a group mindset have a mindset of constant learning so keep learning keep reading keep research well and at the end of the day i'm very very certain that we will all win so because the market is so big that we have over 600 million people in sub-saharan africa who lack access to affordable and clean electricity 600 million that's a lot in fact just 1 million is enough if you have if you can reach 1 million people with your product you become a millionaire or even a billionaire in, in, in africa all right so there's a lot of uh there's a huge market out there for all of us so all we just need is the collaboration we just need to come together have a long-term perspective keep working hard and keep doing it yeah so that's what i'll say thank you You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. So I said this has been explosive. Um, you know, you are people, and it's it's great to get this feedback. Um, you know, and to hear you say, can you can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's very well. Oh, okay, okay, everyone can hear me. So I just I, I saw a couple of questions on the chat box. Um, I can't find them here now. So can you help me read them out? Okay. one apply for funds so the question is how does one apply for funds or get information on, on opportunity of funds so i mean the whole point of this entire conversation is to talk about you know spotlight the fact that we we have a you know an incubation program and a great opportunity for startups to grow their businesses um and receive funding for of course the most innovative so i think that answers that question um and of course, there are several investment opportunities that we make available. Um, so I, this is where you sign up for our newsletters because we share this information on our newsletters. But more especially, this is, um, Alon is a major player in this space. This is what they do. Um, make sure that your business is viable, it's commercially viable and is solving the problem and you receive investments from Alon. Um, as Dr. Weber once said, if Alon is here to invest in you, you should ask yourself why. Um, so this brings our session to a close. Thank you so much. Um, you made this very exciting for me and I'm sure this was exciting for you as well.
I'll hand over to my colleague Dr. to um, wrap this up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Wow. I guess we've we've come to the end of um, our two day webinar and. Goodness, um, these were very, very enlightening, very exciting, interesting, explosive, like so many adjectives for all the panels that we had. And I can't express my gratitude enough, honestly. You've all brought so much experience, so much knowledge, so much expertise. And I trust that everybody who's been in attendance um, for these past two days, uh, they have so much to take away from, because like, we've been taking notes and we've taken so many notes to the point where we're even thinking of applying them into our own lives, you know, our own careers. And, you know, it just shows that no matter where you are in your career, there's always more to learn. There's always more to do. You know, you never stop learning, never stop learning. Hello, can everyone hear me? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. We lost you for a minute. Sorry about, yeah, sorry about that. The, um, having some challenges today. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you so much. You really gave us so much knowledge and expertise. And I trust that everyone who's been in attendance today has really learned a lot from it. Um, so I just want to give the final vote of thanks. Um, thank you for um, everyone, all our participants who came as well. Um, I really hope that you took away a lot from this. Um, I hope that you enjoyed these webinars and hopefully there'll be more in, in the future. So please, by all means, come, come join us again when we invite some of our speakers back and even new speakers. Um, I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you feel energized. There'll be, there's so many opportunities out there in this sector and I hope that you feel very much inspired to take action, to take initiative, be proactive, and just follow some of the advice that, or follow all the advice that they've given you really, because these are people who've been there, who've done it, who know what they're talking about. And the fact that they've um, taken out time from their busy schedules to really spend time with us and impart this knowledge on us, just goes to show how important and how vital it is for us to really jump on this information now and to you know really kick, kick the tires in and get, get the ball rolling. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.